Hello and welcome back to the Cambrian Virtual Show, the show that we're delivering between the 22nd and the 29th of May. Uh, during this time, we're giving on average uh, three speakers a day. Today has been a very special day. Uh, we're having five speakers, so it's absolutely wonderful to fit these people in today. Um, you can see all our previous recordings and all the live events coming up on our website, which is www.cambrianphoto.co.uk. There's also a link in the description that will take you straight to the page that you need. Uh, on there, as I said, you can see all the previous recordings. Uh, you can click on them either on our Facebook or YouTube pages, uh, and you can also see all the lives that we've got coming up as well. So uh, you can check that out there. Also, we're very happy to announce that we're giving all of these uh, virtual talks for free. Uh, because of this, we are asking for donations. Uh, if you go to uh, the same website, uh, you'll be able to find a donations link. Uh, all of the uh, proceeds will go to chosen charities and uh, the local food food bank as well. So uh, that's lovely. Uh, please let us know that uh, you are watching live. It's always uh, nice to see if, if people are actually watching. So, uh, and we're not streaming to Facebook. What has happened? <laughs> An error has occurred. Go live. Okay, I think that's working. I need to pay more attention to uh, the little tick boxes in the corner there. Uh, apologies if you're just tuning in on Facebook. I've just done that spiel that I do every time when we go live, <laughs> so you didn't miss much. Um, thank you very much for, for coming. Uh, please let us know uh, in the comments that, uh, that you are with us, and hopefully you are. Just make sure that we are live streaming and we are, I believe. <laughs> Please let me know. <laughs> uh, that's brilliant. Uh, yes, I can see the, uh, uh, see the viewers climbing a little bit now. Uh, please let us know that you're watching live. Uh, we did have a bit of technical diff difficulties at the beginning there, so uh, let us know. Uh, yes, brilliant, coming through, absolutely fine. Um, right, let's introduce uh, our speaker for this evening. Uh, it's lovely to have him along, uh, Kevin Mullins. Hi, Kevin, how's it going? Hey, Paul, I'm all right, how are you doing? I, I, yeah, I'm all right now. Now I've got some nice green boxes up at the top there. Some uh, some technical difficulties at the beginning there, so uh, apologies there. Kevin, it's good to see you. Um, obviously, very strange times, especially for a wedding photographer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, not, not the best of times. Uh, but you've been keeping yourself or trying to keep yourself uh, uh, busy. Uh, I noticed that uh, the Fuji cast has been doing their uh, their daily uh, talks at the moment, uh, which is which has been brilliant. Obviously, you, you co-host the Fuji cast. Uh, obviously, you're in, you're enjoying uh, you're enjoying that. Yeah, I mean the so when did we go into lockdown? March the thirteenth or something was it? Some, yeah. Something like that. And uh, Neil and I, who um, present the Fuji Cast with me, which is a was a weekly podcast, and we decided that we would go daily for the duration of the the lockdown to try and try and cheer cheer up people's spirits, so to speak. And uh, and we've done something like sixty nine days or something now, and uh, we're finishing on Sunday. And I have to say, I will be relieved that we're finishing you know I'll, I'll miss doing it but actually it's time to go back to weekly and and as the lockdown you know kind of calms down a bit then we'll we'll be able to go back to weekly which is good yeah i i think it has sort of yeah like like you said you know we're we're we're, we're starting to potentially see the end of uh what what may be a lockdown so uh and it sort of fits in quite well with uh, uh with with ending the the, with, the the dailies which everyone has enjoyed i know they have uh to, to going back to weeklies <laughs> yeah uh also uh uh a new web new black and white website that you've launched as well mm. uh so uh the uh, ministry of shadows which is uh, which is lovely to see and yeah. some brilliant presets that you can get on there as well so uh notice that you can get some uh, wonderful presets that you've made uh, up on there as well so uh, which i'll put in the uh, links into the comments as well so uh yes it's, 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 my my uh, long list of to do that i had this time to do everything with so you know, kind of had this ticking off everything that I've been planning on doing for five years. 
and because now there's no weddings i can do them <laughs> yeah yeah that's it and uh, yeah it's wonderful to to, to see you work up there as well uh yeah you've got something uh planned for us uh this evening as well so you've uh, made a little presentation um so uh without uh, further ado i'd like to hand over to you kevin and uh uh, in, enjoy uh, everyone that's watching enjoy uh, the experience of kevin mullins <laughs> <laughs> now that's something that most people never say um <laughs> <laughs> thanks paul um so yeah thanks for inviting me here it's uh you know it's nice to um to catch up with people and especially in these these weird times so a couple of things that i will say um i can see the comments on the uh, that are coming through facebook which is great um, they're going to go very quickly. So if I can see questions in there, I might um, pop through and answer them as I, I kind of go through, or we might try and mop some of them up at the end. Um, but feel free to, to kind of fling questions in there should you have any. Um, I'm going to do a, a little presentation which has some uh, personal photography, some wedding photography, some street photography at the end if we can get there. Um, and also, if people are interested, I might do a little bit of editing. Depends on how the time goes, etc. But but we should be able to get through that. Um, like I say, I'm a <laughs> I'm a professional wedding photographer with no weddings right now. But uh, you know, there's there's people in far worse situations. So it's it's great that we've got all this technology to allow us to to communicate and do these things. Imagine having to do this. If imagine if this was like 1955 or something, what would we have done? Um, so, as I said, I'm going to share the desktop now. So you will go straight into my PowerPoint slide. Um, and just go into, oops, share screen. It's very weird because normally when I do presentations or give talks, I can see when people are falling asleep or if they're yawning or they just get up and walk out. Um, so if you are falling asleep or you're yawning, you'll have to write it in the comments so I can see. Um, right, here we go. All right, so you should be able to see my desktop, and uh, if you can't, just uh, let myself or Paul know. Um, now, what we're going to talk about is this idea of the candid world of, uh, of Kevin Mullins. Um, and, but before we start, I'll talk about a little bit about how I started um, and uh, where, where I am now. Um, you can see there on the screen there's a quote from Don McCullin. Many of you will have heard of Don McCullin. Um, who is a uh, was a conflict photographer, no, just a generally beautiful photographer. And the quote there says, photography for me is not looking, it's feeling. If you can't feel what you're looking at, then you're never going to get others to feel anything when they look at your pictures either. And that's really important for me, I think, when I'm shooting, especially when I'm shooting weddings and my own personal work, that idea that people um, need to be able to get some kind of emotion from their pictures. Um, I'll touch on this a little bit later, but I often say to people, uh, especially my students, I say that your your pictures don't actually need to be good. They just need to be important. And how that manifests itself is, is irrelevant. As long as the people in the images or, or receiving the images feel a connection with those images, then you've done the job. And that's that's far more important to me personally than the technicalities of everything. Now, I started shooting weddings professionally back in 2008, I think it was, 2007, 2008. And prior to that, I'd never owned a camera, never really uh, took pictures or anything like that. It was a complete and utter career change. Um, but I wanted to really kind of explore this idea of documentary photography. And that, that's what appealed to me at the time. And I think subsequently since then, I've shot about 500 or so weddings. Um, so it's all going, all going reasonably well. Now, um, I'm here kind of, uh, I'm not going to be here to, to sell you Fujifilm cameras, but I am a Fujifilm ambassador. So all of the pictures you're going to see here are shot with Fujifilm cameras, various ones. And um, this was actually the very first, one of the very first pictures I took with the original FinePix X100. And uh, that was back in 2011. Up until that point, I'd been shooting my weddings with uh, a Canon system, which was great. There was no problems with it. Um, but I purchased this, this FinePix X100. They used to call it FinePix in those days. They dropped that name eventually. And uh, I got home and I, I took a couple of pictures of the kids in the garden. And and I, I like something clicked. It just, just something clicked. And it just so happened I was using Fujifilm cameras. It could have been uh, Sony cameras. It could have been Panasonic. It could have been any of the mirrorless cameras. But what happened was I could suddenly see in the viewfinder what I was going to get. I could get closer. I could use, I, you know, it wasn't come encumbering me to stop shooting. Um, you know, I was finding with my Canon system or my DSLR system that I was 
struggling to use the cameras between the weekends, between the shoots. So, you know, just kind of picking the camera up and shooting was was the, the pivotal point, if you like. And that really started me on a long journey of uh, photographing pretty much everything that I can do um, in a personal basis. And it's helped me, obviously, with the business. But the most important stuff to me is this idea of uh, a personal legacy. So, you know, th th that sounds like a very grandiose term. But ultimately, what I'm looking for is to be able to give my kids and their kids and their kids kids this this idea of the normal um you know it doesn't have to be posed it doesn't have to be staged it's just the everyday stuff that we all see and these memories we all have of you know little kids when they're the first kind of potty training and all that kind of stuff uh you know the we have these memories but we don't really have the pictures of them we might have an iphone snap or something but ultimately my my ambition really now is to have this long uh, legacy that will will really reach beyond me and reach beyond the kids and you know into f future generations. Um, now, of course, the way that I shoot is the way that many other people shoot as well in this this kind of candid style, if you like. And it doesn't mean that I I don't have an appreciation for other styles. Of course, I do. Um, but I I really have this uh, this love of seeing the uh, the normal stuff, you know, and reminding myself of the normal stuff. So, you know, things like the kids having breakfast, you know, and, and we're just picking away at some fruit and water. And, you know, how long how long in the future will Albi be drinking out of a, an old jam jar with a straw like that? And once it stops, it stops. And so, you know, I really want to have these pictures as we move forward in life that, that kind of helped me tell this story of what happened with us as a family. Now, this picture, similar, same time, obviously, as you can see, same, uh, same uh, bunch of grapes. But I picked this one to show you because I want to talk to you about the idea of um, the difference between candid pictures and, and just kind of random snapshots, I think. So a picture, regardless of the style, regardless of the technique, regardless of how you're shooting, what you're shooting, only needs to have three good elements. That's light, composition, and moment. It could be a portrait shoot, it could be a landscape shoot. But once you think about that, you have those those three elements, the light, the composition, the moment. And if you're in a studio, you might be setting the light up. The composition is how you're going to pose the model, et cetera. And the moment is the look, obviously. The same with landscape photography. If you're setting, if you're going out to shoot a landscape, you're likely to go during the golden hours. Uh, you're likely to pick something that has a foreground attraction, um, you know, and then you're going to have a sunset or something, which is the moment. So this idea of light composition and moment is really important. And, and where I live in Malmesbury in, in Wiltshire, it's, you know, it's an ancient town and our house is like I don't know, 250 years old. So it's very small, very dark. And, uh, you know, we have very small opportunities when it comes to daylight. So it's still important to remember those three principles, light composition and moment, even when you're just taking snaps of your kids at home. Now, Saying that, that doesn't mean I don't have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands and thousands of just snaps on my phone. Of course I do. Um, but the ones where I'm trying to do with this kind of legacy project, if you like, I, I tend to think a little bit more consciously uh, how I'm going to take these pictures. And it's the same way that it manifests itself in the weddings. The wedding work is exactly the same, light composition and moment. And we'll touch on that a little bit later on anyway. So images like this... Um, I know, obviously, this is Albi. He's, uh, you know, a little tear in his eye there. But he, um, he, he you know, we have these. Uh, I remember speaking to my mother a while back and, um, you know, a few years back, actually. And she was saying, oh, you know, when you used to cry, you used to kind of come and, uh, you know, tear would fall down one side of your face or something and come and give me a hug. And, you know, we don't have the pictures of those. And obviously, partly that's a generational thing. There were no digital cameras in those days. But I think that as a story and as this idea of being able to tell, uh, you know, how life is or was in those days, then, you know, being able to shoot the, the good, the bad and the ugly is all part of that story. Um, now, you know, I, I love this picture, of course, my wife doesn't like it so much for obvious reasons. But the point is that in the future, we'll look back at this picture and we'll have a memory. Um, and that's something that I feel, even though we, I love the fact that we can use mobile phones to take pictures constantly, I think that's a really good thing. I do feel like sometimes we ignore the everyday, we ignore the obvious, 
and we just take pictures a lot of the time we're just taking pictures tourist pictures if you like um selfies and land you know the stuff that's in front of us rather than the details and the moments and they're the stuff that can can get lost so here we're on the beach in spain um when we used to be able to go on holidays and you know again it's there's nothing there's nothing clever about these pictures but they're just strong and obvious memories um and i suppose the reason why i'm showing you these pictures is because you know you it's that old cliche of, of having a camera with you at all times and that can be of course anything it doesn't matter what camera it happens to be um but you know how many times if you're honest with yourself how many times have you felt yourself thinking oh, I'm going to take a picture of that. And then actually you don't even reach for the phone. You think, oh, I'll, there'll be another time. It will happen. Um, and often it doesn't. And, you know, you, you having that camera with you, regardless what type it is, will allow you to to keep this uh, this idea of the, the project going, the legacy. Um, so here, still in Spain, simple snapshots, right? It's simple stuff. Um, but these are the pictures that really fuel my passion for photography. And, you know, I'm really, really keen to make sure that, we have this stuff forever, you know, and it's not it's not just uh, it's not just a fleeting thing that sits on the phones and then just disappears. Um, Sarah asked a question about um, printing these images and albums and stuff, and yeah, I do um, I do print and I do my, all my wedding albums go through Jorgensen Albums, which is a Australian company, and my prints or I in fact I have this print and I even have the print of um, Albie with the tear. I have that very big print of that. Um, and we use a place up in Newcastle called Digital Lab for that. So all of the prints get done. Not everything gets printed, of course, but I think it is important to have prints done. Absolutely, especially stuff that's you know important like this. Um, now this is this is a candid shot, but it's, it looks much more like a portrait, of course, because that's you know he's staring straight at me. Um, but now you know the, we have these we have these ideas of the stuff that happens in our lives, and when we're on holiday. Uh, we go for a, you know, a couple of weeks to Spain in the summer and I'll be blessing. He puts that mask on, puts that face mask on when he gets there and he doesn't take it off until we, get, we leave practically. So that's a theme for our holiday. And that's something that, you know, I really want to uh, to capture and, and keep going, um, you know. And so I suppose the reason why I'm showing you these personal pictures is because that's where the photography should start. The candid side of things. Um, now, I don't know. Many of you might be wedding photographers. Many of you may be personal photographers, amateurs. It doesn't really matter. But. I think hopefully that you know when you see pictures that other people make it will you know encourage you to just keep shooting everything that you think is important doesn't have to be good remember just important um stuff like this you know how times are flying he's he's got his little uh, ipad or whatever it is there you know pitch black practically 12800 iso late at night and you know he's just taking this picture the memories that we all have so um, just to give you an example of why that's important, if you think back to that very first image that I showed you of the two of them in the in the garden, um, Rosa with the finger in her mouth and Albie with the fingers where they shouldn't, where little boys should never put their fingers. Um, this is Rosa just a couple of days ago. You know, um, it's one of the kind of little lockdown portraits I've done, and she's she's kind of twelve now and moving on in life, and you know it goes by boom like that. It is a cliche, but we need to have these personal pictures, I think. Now, personal pictures aside, the um, the way that this kind of comes together in my business is that it, uh, I have a lot of times with my wedding clients where they will they will come to me after they've had babies, a couple of years after they've, they've got married, and they will say, oh, you remember that thing you did at their wedding? Can you, can you do that for us at home with the kids? What they mean is, can I just come and you know spend time with them, being normal and just doing everyday things, um, which I love doing. I love doing that day in the life storytelling stuff. And a lot of people don't really, um, I suppose, kind of know that that kind of style of photography is an option for family photography. And it is. And it's a very popular option, too. Um, people are often uncomfortable with having their pictures taken. So if you just say to them, you know what? I'm just going to turn up. I'm just going to be like another person in the room and I'm going to take pictures of the things that I think are interesting and I'm going to tell the story of your day. And uh, that to people is really, really interesting, uh, really exciting for them. Now, I'm going to show you a little slideshow um, after this this little picture here. So this kind of stuff, for example, um, you know, mum, bless her, struggling there to, to give the little baby some medicine, uh, little girls helping herself to, <laughs> to the dinner before it gets uh, put on the table. Um, I'm going to show you a slideshow now where these two children actually met. 
So on the right there, we have a little girl called Maya, and then the little baby there has um, obviously is just very young. Um, but the slide, I've been documenting this family for maybe f five, six, seven years now. Uh, and it started with the the birth of Maya, which is on the right-hand side. And so what you're about to see is actually uh, the birth of Lenny, who is the little baby there. So in the middle of this, I have to warn you, there is a, it's a cesarean birth. Um, so it's a little bit kind of graphic, but obviously it all makes sense. Now start, start thinking about storytelling, and I'll talk to you more about the images once we've seen the slideshow. Maya meets Lenny. This was all shot on an X100F and an X-Pro2. Okay, so um, what you hopefully will have got from that little kind of uh, slideshow is obviously what was happening during the day. Um, but then you can start to understand this idea of uh, the power of storytelling. And, uh, you know, a story, just like a book, always has a start and a middle and an end. So if you're trying to tell any story, even if you're just uh, telling the story of your day trip to the beach or something if you want to do it with any kind of passion uh, or any kind of output I should say you want to try and think of a start and a middle and an end uh, in that story you will have seen the clock the clock on the wall uh, and that clock is skewed and so I'm not the kind of photographer who's going to edit that and straighten it up or anything because that's what they will remember um, but they will they will also uh, you know use that as pivots throughout the story to understand the the time of the day and where they were and that's why the clock is the last image as well that that kind of lets them know it's the end of the story so that idea of storytelling is really powerful uh, you will also have seen through there and this is what you'll see in 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 the other slideshows that we're going to look at in a bit is this idea of islands of color um or islands of color and black and white so instead of having color color black and white black and white black and white color color black and white black and white etc I specifically decide which elements of the day will be in which format. Uh, for weddings, that will usually manifest itself with, I will decide whether the bridal prep is gonna be in black and white or whether it's gonna be in color. The ceremony will be in black and white or in color. I very rarely mix it. And that's that goes back a little bit to Sarah's question about printing because if you imagine all of those images in a book or in a gallery or an exhibition, 
it's a much easy it's much easier on your eye it's much easier for the flow uh, for the visual flow if you have a concise and a considered editing style throughout um so weddings are obviously the the, the bread and butter the income um and you know i've i've had some kickback in the past about uh shooting them as i do which is entirely candid not so much now but right in the beginning um where it wasn't it wasn't seen as the as the normal way of shooting but i really you know i say to my clients that i want you to have images that are going to uh you know you're they're going to give you uh, a view of your wedding from your guest's point of view your guest side point of view rather than from a photographer's point of view now when i shoot i'm i'm shooting with uh, typically an xt3 and an x pro 3 they're my my prime bodies that i'll use um i'll also have an x100f or an x70 in my in my jacket pocket uh, just in case i need those um, I'm nearly always using a 23 mil and a 56 mil lens. Uh, for those of you that are in the full frame world, that's the equivalent of 35 and 56. Um, now there are there are newer uh, newer versions of these cameras, the X100V, which I'm sure Sarah probably has, has just got in stock, and the XT4 also. I don't have those yet, um, and uh, I probably won't be able to install it until I start getting some weddings back on the books. Um, but typically, it all goes in a little bag like that. Um, and you know, I'm good to go. I carry very little, as little as possible to get my, to get my wedding shooting done. Now, um, we, we touched on this already. I'm just going to go to Margaret's question, uh, before we go into more into the wedding stuff. And she said, how do you make a space for yourself in the midst of such intimate moments? Uh, so much going on with the process. Um, it's a really good question. So for something like that for the birth photography obviously it has to be um, fully cleared with the um the surgeons and, the, and everybody in that room in fact have to have to be happy with it um and you know the way that i will shoot almost everything uh for that kind of project is very in in silent mode so the, the shutters are on silent so there's no click 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 going on um and as discreetly absolutely as discreetly as possible so in all cases i'm behind the patients i'm behind the mum and dad definitely not getting in the way of the um of the staff or anything like that and uh, you know i'm there all day so i'm kind of blending in as much as i possibly can a lot of the pictures you're going to see now with the wedding stuff are also similar in that i'm going to be shooting from uh where's my camera uh from my uh from the hip if you like or from my chest level so you know you don't always have to raise the camera to your eye and the moment you raise the camera to your eye, then that's going to give the game away, of course. But if you're shooting from lower down, even if it's just below your kind of chin level, then you're not going to be interfering so much in terms of, yes, you're taking a picture. But the most important thing is the integrity of the moment. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. So we'll, we'll, we'll kind of come back to that. Light composition moment, we've already talked about those things. Light is absolutely critical. I shoot exclusively with um, natural light until the dancing at that point i'll use a little led light potentially um but i don't use flash or anything like that again absolutely no problem if you need to do that or you wish to do that or you like the results from that for me it's it's natural light uh composition of course is is can be tricky so um you know i've learned over the years that composition is up to me in terms of i will never direct or in, or encourage anybody to move or move into good light or look at me or smile or anything like that it's entirely up to me to position myself to get the images that I need to get without interfering with the moment. Um, and the moment, of course, being that critical part, okay, critical part for the, the, the image itself. And we'll talk about the integrity of the moment soon. So light. Um, now, the images you're seeing here are pretty much um, JPEGs out of the camera, maybe with a little dodging and burning done on the sides. And one of the benefits of, of the Fujifilm system, for me at least, is that I can see through the viewfinder um, what I want to get. So the electronic viewfinder will allow me to see that light. Now, here's a little tip. If you, if you do have a camera with an electronic viewfinder and you have a camera that allows you to shoot in a black and white mode, try shooting in black and white for a prolonged period of time. Even if you shoot RAW, your RAW files will always be in color. If you want to shoot raw, if you want to shoot through the viewfinder in black and white, you will see the light much easier. It, you'll see the fall off, you'll see the definition, you'll see the highlights, the shadows. It will just, it's like a, a light bulb moment, pardon the pun. 
Um, and, you know, try and get used to that. That's it's a really, really useful thing to do. So maybe now while we're in this lockdown, switch your camera to black and white. Make sure it's in RAW so you've got your color images at the end of it uh, if you wish to uh, and explore that option. It's really, really powerful. So in this case, this is the, obviously a little bit of light coming from a Velux window in the top of the church. Um, I've metered accordingly to, so I don't have to do any work afterwards in terms of editing this image, maybe a little bit of vignetting or strong bit of vignetting. Now in this image, for the same principle applies, the light is what's making this image work. Um, now, as I said, I don't do any kind of move. I'm not gonna say to the the, the bride and the, the makeup artist here, look, you know, I can't get to that radiator side. I can't get the pictures I need. So can you move? That's just not what I do. I have no inter intervention like that. So what I did learn many years ago is that they, it's easier to work with the light rather than work against it. Uh, often back in the day, I might have looked at a scene like this and panicked and just ride the exposure compensation so I've got more detail in the bride's face. Um, and obviously that's gonna be at the expense of all, of all of the highlights in the scene. Now, what I think about nowadays is actually, how can I use that light properly? How can I make that light work for me rather than work against me? So in this case, I'm gonna look at the, the kind of light model in the, the bride's face. It's cropped a little, so you can't see the top of the, um, the hairspray can there. But also I want, you know, I wanted to get the hairspray. I wanted to, uh, to to connect the dots of what was going on in this image. And so by by modeling the light, positioning myself, using spot metering in the camera, this ca this image was taken in um, aperture priority. So all I'm doing is, is you know, I've wrapped it right down to 1.2. The camera is doing everything else. I'm just metering, moving my camera, adjusting the exposure very slightly and getting the shot that I need to get. So working with the light rather than against it really powerful um, now this is an interesting point so uh, you know we we are and, and this is something I say to my clients a lot of the time you know you can anybody can be a photographer anybody can click the buttons anybody can understand aperture shutter speed and all of that kind of stuff um, but that would be a really boring world if we all did exactly the same thing so my clients are employing me for what I see through the viewfinder and what you're seeing through the viewfinder will be different to what the person next to you sees through the viewfinder. And that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of photography. But that's our observational skills, not our photography skills. Um, so seeing and not shooting is really, really important. And, you know, I find that these days with cameras um, being so powerful and so quick that often we'll see, certainly in the wedding world, people will just shoot, 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 shoot so many pictures, 30,000 pictures or so, and then, you know, kind of cherry pick the best ones. And of course, they're going to get good pictures. But what are they going to do? What's the expense of that? The expense is the experience for the bride and the groom and the community at that wedding. They're going to just come away feeling ambushed, feeling paparazzi. Um, so actually spending time relaxing, watching, understanding the characters, and then going for the images, I find is a much better way to stop the people um, even kind of noticing you, if you like, much quieter way of shooting. At the bottom there, it says use themes and sounds to help you see. And again, this is really, really important as well. For those of you that are uh, wedding photographers, or perhaps even if you're just thinking, right, tomorrow I'm gonna do a story of my family at home. And you might think, hmm, hang on, there's not a lot happening. What's, you know, there's nothing, they're just sat there, they're not doing anything. Um, here's a little tip, just put your camera down, Get your phone out and just record the audio of the room or the garden or the street corner or wherever you are just record the audio take yourself away listen to that audio and the audio will tell you so much about what's going on it will absolutely tell you uh you could do it tonight you could go and stand outside your front door record the audio for five minutes you'll hear cars you'll hear rivers you'll hear birds tweeting you'll hear people screaming down the hill you'll, you'll hear all kinds of stuff uh, you might hear a drain or something, and that will tell you what's going on. And that, that they are then the um, the founding blocks of your story. So if you're struggling for anything, think about the sound. Give yourself a theme. The theme might be right. I'm going to shoot the color red. I'm going to shoot, you know, kids being kids. I'm going to shoot interaction, humanity. Give yourself a, t a moment. Um, and that kind of brings us to shots like this, where the integrity is is critical. Now this uh, this bride. And her grandmother um, are obviously having a very tender moment. Now, what I don't want to do at this point is rock up and shoot 30 pictures, click, 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 and then wander off to the side and, you know, review the images on the back of my camera. Because the moment I do that, 
this this lady the the, the um, older lady especially will will you know she will she'll hear the camera she'll see me she'll she'll decide actually you know i want to have a a picture a portrait more rather than this kind of picture so what happens at that point is that this entire moment in time goes just like disappears woof it's gone um because the photographer in, you know in my case i'm the one that's there and to have moments like this disappear just because i'm i'm clack 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 clacking away is you know is criminal absolutely criminal if these pictures did not exist these moments in time did not exist because i was not there that would uh, you know upset me greatly so you can see here uh, i was talking about this earlier that the the camera I, I mean i'm not particularly tall but i'm taller than these people and uh, the camera is at my chest level so i've moved in i've taken three frames x1 xt2 in this case um and then i've just moved away and just allowed them to to get on with it and have their moments the most important thing is that when they look at pictures like this they think oh yeah do you remember when we embraced after the wedding rather than oh yeah do you remember when the photographer ruined that moment when we were trying to have a chat that's critical so stuff like this similar type of thing um bad picture technically but the moment is important um bridal prep i'm kind of in the corner mum comes in she's she's had her own personal battle with uh, with illnesses as you can see and uh you know so i have to decide at this point how am i going to deal with this am i going to uh you know shoot and, and kind of upset the 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 scene and no of course not i'm taking one shot from very low down they have no idea that i'm taking this picture and then i i move away you know i move away let them have their moments let them let them do what they need to do and then i'll come back a little bit later the integrity and the fun of the wedding day are always important um and it starts starts early you know when i get there early all this extra stuff that you see everybody sees it um most, most people ignore it um but having your eyes open and remember that going back to this idea of being a uh, observer will allow you to capture a lot more stuff as you move forward okay so we've talked about lights um jpegs from the camera is brilliant um and this idea of being able to shoot from the inside um you know it's really really useful in terms of having the smaller cameras now again i'm not going to knock dslrs because i used to use them and they were great um and, and obviously nowadays dslrs are actually a lot smaller than they used to be but this idea of being able to see in the electronic viewfinder and being able to move around very quickly and behave like a guest is really important. Have a couple more shots here. We don't see that very often these days, the, the veil lift, quite sad. Um, GFX image from one of the colleges in Oxford. And then on the dance floor, uh, you know, getting close and again, get the picture, move away, um, let them carry on. What I don't want at this point is for them to, to see me there and then start kind of acting up to the camera because, of course, they've had uh, several glasses of champagne by now. Uh, so, you know, in, shoot, 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 move away, move on quick. Um, more about light here. So the light obviously is coming from the front of the bride, but the story is at the back of the bride. So I need to I need to think about that. But at the same time, you know, <laughs> bridal prep is always the most difficult part because, uh, you know, it's usually five or six uh, typically younger ladies, and then I turn up with my, you know, my beard and my my cameras, and you know, upset the apple cart massively. Um, so I have to be very sensitive of that. So I don't want this this girl who's uh, who's doing the dress up at the back to to lose focus of what she's doing. So again, the angle. If you see the angle, it's down low. I'm not raising the camera to my eye. I'm getting that shot pretty much one-handed. Uh, you know, I might even in some cases if I'm shooting with the X100. I'll often have like one hand in my pocket and shoot with the other one higher up. So in this case, I'm using the the, the gentleman as a frame um, because the bridal car is coming up the up the path. She came she came a bit too early, uh, so nobody had gone back gone into the church at that point. But I saw the car come in, um, and instead of just taking the normal shot of the car arriving up the street uh, up the hill, I thought actually there's guy there's people out here now. This is good. This doesn't normally happen. I can make something out of this. So by getting in really close to these guys, um, and actually I think if I remember rightly here, I, uh, they started chatting to me, but you can, again, you can see the position of the camera, it's low down. So I get my frame, and I think at that time I said to them, oh, you, better, you better put your skates on, lads, you've got to get inside. Um, now this kind of stuff I love as well. You know, Normally for bridal prep, you'll go to a wedding, uh, to a mum and dad's house usually, or something like that. And they'll be like, oh, don't go in the kitchen, it's a right mess, don't, you know, don't do that. 
Um, and that's the first place I go if I can if I can get access to it and I can shoot uh, something interesting through the doors. Because look at that picture, right? Imagine that in twenty years' time, they're going to be able to say, "Oh my word! Do you remember when we had that? Uh, you know that that boiler? Do you remember those green rubber gloves we used to have? Look, the kitchen, the house might not even be there now, or they might have had an extension, or the pictures on the walls are different. Uh, everything's going to be different, basically, and this will give them an entire memory, not only of the wedding day." But also of the context and and you know everything that was going on in their lives at that time, um, and I think that's really important when you're trying to tell a story and you know certainly when you're trying to do a documentary approach to things, is to not just concentrate on the obvious, uh, and in fact I will concentrate more on the unobvious if I can. Okay, I'm going to show you a, a full wedding now, which is uh, X Pro Two, uh, X T Two, X Pro Two. It's a couple of years old, 56 mil, 23 mil lens. This was a, um, a a fusion wedding of sorts. So they got married in in France. She was Jewish and he was Christian, um, and they couldn't quite settle on the on the, the the celebration. So they had both a rabbi and a priest. Uh, which is uh, pretty rare to see. So you'll get you'll get the drift of it. Um, and again, uh, have a quick look out for this idea of uh, islands of color.
so um, a little bit of a <laughs> of a crazy wedding, a long wedding, um, but a nice wedding. And uh, I think you know when when we think about weddings and uh, candid pictures and everything, the most obvious place to shoot candid pictures is is on the street. Um, and there's a quote there from John Merwitz, who is a very famous. Uh, if you've not heard of him, check him out very famous American street photographer. And he says, uh, think about photography as being a flexible medium that expresses dramatic content, but also has the potential to reveal your emotions and sense of the time you live in. Now that's the, the critical thing there is this idea of the sense of the time that you live in. Um, and I touched on this earlier and this idea that a, a picture that you might think is mundane now in the future will not be, even if you just take a photograph of your car or the, the street outside of your house, you know, if you do one thing tonight, take a picture of your front door, just whatever's outside the front of it, save it, and then look at it in 20 years' time, and you will see so much memories and difference. Uh, and it doesn't need to be a good picture, but it will become an important picture. So here I'm in Tokyo, and uh, if you've ever been there, you'll know that there's a very famous crossing called Shibui Crossing, which is uh, it's it's an insane place. It's like four and a half thousand people cross this crossing every time the lights change. Uh, and of course, it's it's very popular with tourists. So I decided I only had a couple of hours there, and I decided to um, uh, you know try and get shots of the uh, of the locals, if you like, rather than the tourists, just being normal people. And I didn't want to do it in color because it is a very colorful place, and there's loads of color pictures of it. But I wanted to concentrate on the light, this lovely evening light that streams into this area. Um, and so, in order to shoot this, I'm using my X100F. I'm zone, what's known as zone focusing, so I've pre-focused to a certain distance in front of me, not very far away, and I've put the camera right down, really low down, and you know I, the people are just passing me by. When it comes to street photography, I'm not a big fan of chasing people or, or you know, kind of hunting as they call it. I prefer to set the scene, pick the light, and, and then just wait for people to come into that area in their own goodwill. If they're happy to walk that close in front of me, then I'll take the picture. Um, so as you can see there, that guy, the guy nearest to me, and of course we won't be able to be doing this for a long time, I shouldn't imagine, is, um, you know, is, is just inches away, just inches away. Um, you know, usual stuff here. And uh, the masks, of course, we will get used to these, but they've been wearing these for a long time in, in Tokyo. Um, and you can see here the, the people in the background uh, putting their fingers up and everything because there's, there's uh, you know, there's, there's live webcams all over the world. And then we have this this lady who's, uh, you know, coming home from work or going out for a, a date or something in, in completely in a different, different mindset. Um, you know, like I said, I think we're losing the right to this. It's, it's sad that we're, you know, we seem to be persecuted for wanting to take pictures that tell the story of today in the future. And, and that's a, that's a really sad thing. And, uh, you know, I think social media is a little bit to blame for that. Whoops. So a couple more shots on the streets. Again, think light and the moment the, the important things here, are the light and the moment, um here we have the uh the three jewish guys uh it's friday morning in uptown manhattan and uh you know somebody said oh you, you managed to get three jewish guys together and, and uh, i was like it's hard to not get three jewish guys together in in uptown manhattan on a friday morning um but the interesting thing about this picture is if you look at the light if you look at the building behind them you can see that the light is bouncing onto that building the sun is up there in the left and yet the the light is is lovely on the guy at the front. Um, so that's a reflected light that's bouncing off a building. So again, what I've done here is I've seen the light first. I've seen the pool of light. I've metered for it accordingly. I've set my scene, and then I just wait for the the characters to walk onto the stage. Um, and that's a that's a better way of doing things for me. And of course, you get the funny moments here and there. Um, Humour plays a part. Uh, different perspectives. This is with the my beloved uh, Fujifilm X70, which is is with the X100, the X70, my favorite cameras of all times. Um, and, you know, when we go back to thinking about themes, you can do this on the streets as well. If you're thinking, yeah, street photography, you just go out and everybody's on their phones or whatever. Um, but remember that point about on their phones. In, in, you know, 15, 20 years ago, people used to take pictures or maybe 30 years ago and think, oh, everybody just reads newspapers. Uh, and now when we see pictures of people reading newspapers, we think, oh, do you remember when people used to use newspapers? Um, so in this case, the theme I'd set myself was the color blue, simple. And so I, because I'm aware of that in my peripheral vision, I'm kind of looking for blue blue blobs. Um, and so I see 
a whole load of blue in this frame. Every, none of these people are, are connected to each other. Then nobody knows each other, um, but they're all wearing blue. And because I'm looking for that, then it gives me an opportunity to take a picture rather than just standing there thinking nothing's happening. It's just people being people. Um, another one of my, my kind of themes and my project is, uh, uh, I, I always feel uncomfortable when I say this, but old, let's just say older people, older people that are still in love. Um, I love that. And so, uh, you know, whenever I see, um, you know, them holding hands or kissing or arms interlocked or whatever, I really try and get a picture. But again, you can see the position of this. If this again is on the X70. I've actually just walked past them with the, the camera is right down by my pocket level. It's waist level. Um, I've taken the shot. I've paused, taken the shot. They have no idea. And I've moved on. Um, you know, and I love that kind of uh, that moment between them is, is really nice. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you another little photo film, all right, which is uh, bringing this all together, this idea about uh, photography and the precious nature of it. Um, but before I show you that, obviously everything I've shown you tonight is is my images and the style that I like, which is quite contrasty black and whites and all candid and, you know, very uh, – I feel there's, there's emotion in the pictures. That's what I'm looking for at least. Um, and just because that's the way I like to shoot doesn't mean that obviously that's the right way to do it. Everybody has their own ways of doing things. Um, and, you know, the power in a power in a candid picture for me is is based on emotion. But absolutely at the same time, I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, friends of mine who are very, very good editorial style wedding photographers who do beautiful kind of Vanity Fair style portraits. And for them, their clients are out there. And for me, my clients are out there. So... Um, we have this little photo film now. This is the kind of thing that I do once a year, um, usually kind of around Christmas time.
Okay. So, um, any questions on that? Uh, let me just stop sharing the screen. So we should be, we should, we should uh, give we give should, uh, give give Erica just a, a second to compose herself. <laughs> there was uh, some uh, the tissue again moments there. So uh, <laughs> uh, that was uh, it's wonderful uh, seeing those images and a lovely ending on uh, some. Really quite emotional pictures there, Kevin. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's uh, let's tackle some questions. Obviously, if you've got some questions, please uh, please post them in the comments. Uh, we can get to them. Uh, I think we have got some from uh, before as well. I'll start mm -hmm. from the bottom up because it's probably easier uh, to get to. Um, let's have a look. Uh, yeah, we had uh, from Margaret. Uh, uh, do you use a, a live view more than the viewfinder? Uh, so we've got two questions here. Uh, so the, uh, live view, so probably the screen uh, or the or the viewfinder, and then also uh, with uh, are you using aperture priority as well? Okay, so um, live view is not really, people who use DSLRs typically think of live view as the LCD on the back, I guess. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, mirrorless cameras also have that, but but also in the viewfinder itself, you can see live view if you want to call it that the electronic version so effectively in the viewfinder you can see what the camera is going to be taking um which is very different to a, a dslr approach so i'm always using uh, it's uh, often i will use the um shooting from the hip method which effectively means that i'll, I'll compose my image and I'll, I'll get everything set up on the camera then i'll bring it down here so i'm shooting blindly i'm not actually raising the camera to the eye not all the time of course but you know, often I'll be like that, especially if I'm in close quarters. Um, and in terms of the aperture priority, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a big believer in, you know, I know what goes into the development of these cameras and and they're very clever people that make these cameras. So I allow the cameras to do as much of the work as possible. They're far, far more intelligent than me. So actually for a lot of the time, if the light is okay, then I'll even use P mode. I'll put everything in P mode. And all I'm responsible for then is finding the moments and looking for the moments and composing the shot. Um, you know, you, of course, you do need to understand and know how to use the camera when necessary. Um, most of the other times, if I'm not using P mode, I'll use aperture priority. Um, and uh, if I need to get some kind of motion blur or anything, then I'll use shutter priority. Um, and I'll typically be using manual when the dancing is happening, if I need to need to get control of that. Um, but yeah, aperture priority, P mode, there's no shame in, in using P mode, that's for sure. That certainly isn't. Um, yeah, so I mean, to the to the either using the screen or the viewfinder, you, you kind of fit in this 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 third uh, one that's uh, that's overlooked, which is uh, which is neither. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of. yeah, absolutely. Um, I tend um, not to I try not to have the LCD on the back showing so much yeah. because you know it's it's just more and, and obviously the, the you know, it's a very retro styled camera so it's a, a lot of people it's just they think it's like a film camera and stuff so it's really really nice yeah uh, we, we sort of t touched on this as well so i mean how do you decide between uh sort of aperture priority and p mode um uh, it's 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 mainly just probably a more in the moment thing i would have thought yeah, so I'll, I'll typically start by, you know, thinking about the light. Now, if the light, I'll use um, auto ISO. So my ISO is, my shutter speed is pegged to the ISO to a certain extent. So I will have my camera set to a minimum shutter speed of maybe 1 125th and a maximum, and, and then, sorry, maximum ISO of uh, 12,800. And if the light is is causing my shutter speed to come down too much, then I'll start taking control a bit more. Um, but as long as I'm happy with the way that the camera's uh, dealing with it, then then that's great. One of the other things that you can do with the cameras in any of the automatic modes, it doesn't matter which one you're in, um, you can then use the, what's known as spot metering. Um, and spot metering means that you can effectively lock the exposure by half depressing the shutter or by using the exposure lock on the back of the camera. So that's how I'm getting those, those very contrasty black and whites. So I'm my focus point and the point that I'm taking the light reading from and allowing the camera, remember, to set the meter is in, mo in, in a lot of cases different. It's not the same place. 
So I can focus on, for example, if I was taking a picture of you now, Paul, I could focus on your, uh, your eyes by focusing, and then I could just tip the camera down a bit and maybe meter off your beard, okay? Uh, and so I'm getting the, the reading, the light reading is from your beard, so that would brighten that bit up. I could then re recompose and take the picture. Um, it's very, it seems like a very complicated uh, way of doing stuff, but it's it's very traditional that metering has always been in cameras, um, you know, and and uh, certainly digital cameras. And and the more you can get used to allowing the camera to do it for you, the more fun it is. It's all about fun. Yeah, we've 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 come we've come away from uh, uh, we've come away from that because it is very traditional that the the whole metering. Uh, with with the cameras, like you said, becoming more and more sort of uh, complex and, and things. But yeah, sort of taking a metering from somewhere is is a very traditional process. Uh, so it, it, it's certainly it's certainly there anyway. Mm. Um, back to the back to the weddings. Uh, we've got uh, how do you deal with families and guests asking for uh, asking for photos at weddings? Uh, uh, when your style is a hundred percent documentary, so I'm I'm guessing this is. Uh, I mean, it's it's uh, Auntie Barbara and Uncle Bob going. You know, can can I get a picture? <laughs> yes, of of yeah. those sort of similar things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a couple of there's a couple of ways that this is dealt with. First of all, um, the, the, I saw another question earlier on about you know what what happens when clients expect more formal stuff, and and for, that just doesn't happen because of the branding, the website. People do not come to me if they want formal photography. We never get to the point of shooting the wedding if if we're if we're so misaligned. You know, they just don't even. For every person that comes to my website and goes, I love that. There may be ten people who think actually that's not what I want, and so the website is doing the, its job. My Instagram is doing its job. It's it's filtering the people that we can work together with. Um, so about a week or so before the wedding, I'll send the um, bride and groom a, a, a pre-wedding questionnaire, if you like. And one of the things that I mention on there is to to remind the key members of their families of my style. So you know, mums and dads, best men, bridesmaids, all of that kind of stuff. Just say, hey, you know what? We got this photographer coming. Uh, he's not he's not a traditional photographer he's just going to get on with his thing and you, you'll see him but he's just going to be buzzing around doing his thing um you know he's not going to be doing kind of formal pictures or anything so in 99 percent of the time that works and i you know i can just go and do my thing and then leave and it's it's brilliant um i mean on many occasions i've had people come up to me and and say who are you with you know, and you know, where, where's your wife or whatever? And and I'm like, no, I'm actually I'm the photographer. Um, but it does happen. So Auntie Barbara and Uncle Jim do sometimes come up to me and say, oh, you know, can we, can we? And of course, I'm never going to say no to that kind of thing. So I'll say, yeah, of course I can. And so you know, I'll raise the camera. I'll take one picture. I'll say, you know, look at me. I'll take the picture. Um, and I won't not give the clients that picture or anything. But the critical thing at that moment in time is that everybody else will have seen you do that. So once I've taken that picture of Auntie Barbara and Uncle Jim, I suddenly go, oh, I need to change my batteries. Uh, I'll be back. <laughs> I leave the room. I leave the room, completely leave the room. And uh, and then it all disappears. And then the, the, the moment is no longer a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, it's... Uh... Yeah, it's 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 a lovely way of dealing with that. By the way, that's uh, that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, oh, um, let's have a look a little bit more down here a little bit, and let's see what we've got. Uh, there's something with a question mark. Uh, love the images, uh, lots of contrast. Uh, do you shoot ETTR or do you avoid or how do you avoid blowing the highlights? Um, ETTR is that the metering? Is yeah, it? I think that must be metering. Yeah, so we we yeah. just kind of answered that with the spot metering effectively. Yeah. So I'm I'm metering for those those highlight areas where necessary. Um, you know, sometimes you, you you meter for the dark areas. Mostly, you're going to be metering for the for the, the highlights. Um, but yeah, spot metering is a real real power. And also by shooting in black and white, even if you're shooting raw, by shooting in black and white, you're going to see the, the the blown highlights so much more than you will in color. Uh, and you yeah. can deal with it, yeah. And obviously, as well, is uh, I think a question that you might have sort of said already. But uh, I mean, uh, even if you're shooting in black and white when looking through the camera, obviously, if you decide to shoot in RAW, then you can still go back and and mm -hmm. you know pull out the color version as well, can't you? It's just yeah. a lot easier to see um, what's happening on a on a black and white photo as far as like contrast is concerned. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, exactly. That's brilliant. Um, I think that's uh, a lot of the uh, questions done, actually. So, um, and then, uh, sorry, Mr. Sorry. Oh, oh, right, okay. Uh, very quickly, just at the end there, uh, Mr. Start, uh, uh, what cameras do you use? <laughs> it's throughout the thing. Uh, you can also rewatch it. Um, but uh, we can give a quick rundown again, just for ambassador sakes, I think. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got, I've got to earn my chilling. Um, yeah, so I'm, uh, I use Fujifilm cameras. Um, currently, I use X100F, X Pro 3. Um, and I've had all variants be before that. I have an X-T3. I don't have an X-T4 or an X-100V. They're the latest versions of cameras. Um, but yeah, always, since 2011, I've shot, shot exclusively Fujifilm. Yeah. That's brilliant. And uh, Gwynvoy, you said you'll watch again, so that's brilliant. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you here, Kevin. Uh, it's uh, always great to see you. And uh, even great seeing your your work and thank you for sharing that with us um and uh we'll make sure you get a lovely big send out so everyone in the, in the comments there please uh, place your thank yous in there it's always nice to see um kevin thank you very much for coming i'll just pop you into uh, the, uh, the green room again and we'll have a quick chat after the uh, uh the live is finished but for now thank you very much for coming cheers kevin no thanks very much Absolutely brilliant to see Kevin there and sharing his work and just looking into how he tackles uh, the type of photography that he does. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, it's been a busy day. Uh, we've had lots going on today. Uh, it's uh, it's wonderful to have you uh, joining today uh, through the uh, five different virtual talks that we've done today. So uh, absolutely brilliant. Uh, as always, you can catch up on all the previous stuff. Uh, by going to our website, which is www.cambrianphoto.co.uk. Uh, if you're re-watching this video, uh, please make sure you uh, like the video. You can still comment in the below. If there's any questions, we'll try and get to them. Um, and if you're watching on our social pages, which I hope you are, on our Facebook, please make sure that you like our page. And if you're watching on YouTube, please make sure that you subscribe to our channel. Uh, that's it for everything today. Thank you very much, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.